Hey everybody, welcome to the next installment of Statistics in Pajamas. We're finally moving from the realm of always looking for differences between groups and starting to think about relationships between variables. Well, it turns out that in nature, it's very common for different variables to display what we call mutual patterns of variation. And really all this means is that somehow they are varying similarly. So for example, when one goes up, so does the other. An example of that would be height and weight, right? That would be a positive relationship. But it also is possible that when you have variation in one variable that increases, the other variable decreases, and that would be a negative relationship. So correlations allow us to quantify this, how much uh, variability between these two different variables uh, happens in common. And if it happens consistently, and we have a statistical test for this, we can say that they are correlated, that they're related to each other, or that they co-vary in a similar fashion. So how do you know when to run a correlation? Well, if we look at our dichotomous key, we still have a continuous response variable. This time, instead of looking for differences, we're actually looking for relationships among those variables. And we have to ask ourselves, are there only two variables that we're testing for relationships between? If that's the case, we can just use a Pearson's correlation. Um, if we have non-normal data in, the, in either of those two variables, we can simply rank the data or use a Spearman's row, which is essentially run on the ranks. If we have more than two variables that we're trying to look for relationships among, we can still do the Pearson's correlation. But we have an additional test called a partial correlation we can run that will help us tease out how much autocorrelation there is among multiple variables. Really a powerful tool um, for being able to isolate uh, the direct impact of, of one variable upon another rather than looking at spurious correlations. We know we're going to use a correlation when we have two or more continuous variables that have been measured on the same unit of observation. So in other words, we may have a whole bunch of observations that we've taken, but both of those measurements, or which, however many variables we're comparing for relationships, those measurements have to be made on all of our observations. And our goal is to see whether or not these are related. We also have to meet some assumptions. All of our observations do have to be independent and random. We need to have normally distributed data. And one thing to keep in mind is that this correlation is really only looking for linear relationships. So if we have nonlinear relationships, we will miss that with this Pearson's correlation. Now, just like all inferential statistical tests, the correlation is trying to quantify something. And specifically, what it's quantifying is how much of the variation in these two different variables occurs in unison. Right? So in other words, how much could you tell about one just by knowing something about the other? If these two variables are closely related and have a relatively high correlation value, you would expect them to be clustered pretty tightly. More common in natural resources is to see the spread a little bit more broad um, across the full range of variables. It's really not that, that often that we're going to see correlations that are this tight. So this would be a moderate correlation. Or maybe there's no correlation at all and it's just a random pattern. So this is sort of a little bit different way of thinking about our data when we're structuring our data set. With correlations, for every single observation that we have, and again, a row in our data table would be one observation. But for each observation, we measure uh, several, however many variables we're interested in comparing relationships among. And so these measurements are all taken on the same observation. And then we'll have multiple observations with those multiple measurements. Now what's really great about correlation is that it doesn't matter what the scale is of these variables. So for example, calcium concentration falls along a completely different range um, than nitrogen. This is percent nitrogen. This is parts per million of calcium. But that doesn't matter because the correlation is going to convert these all to a common scale. And that scale will range from negative 1 for negative relationships to positive 1 for positive relationships. Anything close to 0, usually we say less than an absolute value of 0.2 is a weak correlation. Anything between an absolute value of 0.2 and 0.5, that would be considered mild. 
0.5 to 0.8 would be moderate, and then anything over 0.8 is strong. And, and actually, you know, these are guidelines. Keep in mind, you're interpreting all of this ecologically, so um, in nature, I would still be pretty impressed with anything over, say, a 0.5. So how exactly do we calculate this correlation and what exactly is it doing? We're going to try to quantify how much these two different variables, we'll call them x and y, how much they vary similarly, and we'll take that as a ratio of how much they vary differently or independently. So essentially we're trying to get the ratio of the covariability of x and y to this sort of independent variability of x and y separately. And how do we do that? Well, of course, we have a lovely little formula, and this one shouldn't look too intimidating. It's still, again, straight algebra, um, and we only need a couple of terms. We need to know the sample size, how many observations we have. We need to know each of the values for one of those variables. Again, we'll call it variable x, and we're going to sum up all of those values. Same thing for the variable y. We need to know the values for all of the y's and sum all of those up. We also need to create uh, usually a new column if you're doing this out by hand where you take the value for x and you multiply it by the value for y for every single observation and then sum those up. And then we also need to take each of our x values and square that and then sum it up and take each of our y values and square it and sum it up. So again, it's not super complicated, but the order of operations can get really tricky. So for example, um, this right here is asking you to take your x value for a given observation and square it, and then go to your next observation and take the x value and square it, and then go to your next observation and so on and so forth, and then sum them all up. Whereas this one is asking you first just to sum up all of your x values. Just do that, sum them all, and then square it. So be very careful with the order of operations here. If you're not gung-ho about doing that out by hand, and you happen to have access to software uh, in Excel, you can just use the corel function for the correlation. So I would just enter equals corel, and then it's going to ask you to highlight both of the arrays. And it's basically saying highlight all of variable x, in this case elevation is one variable, and then comma, and then highlight variable y bracket that in, and what it returns is your Pearson's correlation. So this is a correlation of 0.605. If we were to round it, say 0.61, so I would describe that as a moderate positive correlation. Right? That's great. We've just described the relationship, but is it significant? Well, for that, obviously, we need some additional steps. And just like our other tests, we have a critical value table that we can go to to look up the calculated value we would have to beat in order to be considered significant. So most of these tables for the correlation are going to come with multiple significance thresholds here for you. So this would be the 0.1. Here's your standard 0.05. If you had very high power, you might use the 0.01. And we need the degrees of freedom. So for the correlation, our degrees of freedom is the number of observations that we have minus 2. In our example, where we just calculated the 0.605 correlation, that Pearson's correlation, we had 21 observations. And so we have 19 degrees of freedom. If we come over to the table, we can see that the critical value for this test would be 0.5. 433. And we have indeed beaten 0.433. We calculated 0.605. So we have a significant positive correlation. What does that actually mean? Well, if you have a significant correlation, it means all of that variability you had in that in your data, all of the, the changes that you see in one variable um, versus another, they're changing similarly enough that it's unlikely that this is just occurring because of random chance. Right? There's some sort of relationship between these two variables that is causing them to change in a similar pattern. But also, just like our other tests that we've covered so far, even if you do have a significant correlation, that doesn't mean that it's particularly meaningful. We have a secondary metric that we can use for that, and that is called the coefficient of determination, or the R squared. And we've seen this before when we were doing our ANOVAs. It's very similar um, here. We're literally just taking the correlation that we just calculated, 
and we're squaring it. And what this tells us is what percentage of the total variability in these data can be explained by the covariance or the similar variability between the two variables. So with our correlation example of the 0 0.605, we can say that about 30%, 37% of all of the variability between these two variables is varying in common. So the closer you are to one, the more highly meaningful your relationship is. Again though, in nature it's very uncommon um, to see really high R-squared values. So be using your ecological interpretation skills to try to decipher whether or not you really have a meaningful relationship. How would you write up these results? We have some shorthand for this test, just like our others. We're going to specify that we ran a Pearson's correlation by denoting the R. We put our degrees of freedom in brackets, list the calculated test statistic for that Pearson's correlation, list the p-value that we come up with when we're testing for significance, and then we also list the R-squared value. Okay, it's also really helpful in your actual text, so in other words with your words, to state whether or not you have a positive or a negative correlation and whether or not you consider that to be weak, moderate, or strong. And this only has to be done for significant relationships. If you don't have a significant correlation, you're done. There's really nothing else to discuss. In Jump, we're still in the Analyze tab of our toolbar, but this time we're headed down to Multivariate Methods. And that's because these correlations um, can be done on just two variables, but are meant to be able to be run on as many variables as you wanted. So if we go to the Multivariate Methods option, and then we can select Multivariate, it's going to bring us into a new window where we can enter whichever variables it is that we would like to test for correlations on. So notice there is no grouping variable, um, there is no categorical variable here. These are all continuous variables that we can enter into this Y columns box and we can enter as many as we want. So in this example we're looking for a correlation between elevation and foliar nitrogen concentration. So here's my jump data table. You can come up to the Analyze button, go to the Multivariate Methods, select Multivariate, and notice it tells me this is where I can get correlations. When I select that, I can enter whichever variables I'm interested in, and the order doesn't matter. Click OK, and Jump is going to open a new window where it is plotting out my correlations. Remember, Jump is a visual program, so it's always going to try to graphically display your data. So here we can see we have elevation on the x-axis, that's what it's telling us here. We have nitrogen on the y-axis, and we can get a feel for how tight this relationship might be by looking at how clustered um, along sort of the diagonal these two variables are for all of these observations. We also want to look and see, make sure that we don't have a non-linear relationship. Correlations really are testing linear relationships. If we had a relationship that was flat and then suddenly increased, or maybe an exponential relationship, these correlations would not help us figure that out. It also, by default, gives us our Pearson's correlation. Notice that this table is really just a mirror image of itself, so you can just sort of pick uh, one half to look at. And we can see our 0.606, it's rounded for us, our Pearson's correlation. But there's no significance test here. So to get to the actual p-values to figure out whether or not this is a significant correlation, we go to, you guessed it, the multivariate magic triangle. And if we come in here, we can come down and we can ask for our pairwise correlations. This is going to give us output for the p-values associated with that Pearson's correlation. So there's the correlation, there's the number of observations we have, here are the confidence intervals about this correlation, and the p-value or the significance associated with this given correlation for this uh, number of observations, or the 19 degrees of freedom. From this magic red triangle, you have an option for non-parametric correlations. The Spearman's row is um, really commonly, it's widely used, commonly accepted, and it's essentially just running that same formula that we saw for the Pearsons, but on the ranks. And when we pull that up, you can see that it's a little bit 
less powerful, the, the correlation for the spearmins is 0.56 instead of 0.606. So if you had non-parametric data for either nitrogen or elevation, you would default to the spearmins row probability. One other thing to keep in mind about correlations is that they're very sensitive to outliers. So you might have a relationship that actually looks pretty strong, right? But you have a couple of outliers down here. This can really impact the calculated correlation value. So for example, if I were just looking at the correlation of the data here, I would have a correlation of about 0.944. But if I were to include these observations down here, that correlation drops to 0.75. So there is, um, it's a good idea for you to take a look and see if you have any significant outliers within your data set. And this is a little bit different than what we did before when we were looking for outliers just within one variable, right? So with the, the z-scores, you know, we had one variable we had measured and we just wanted to find observations that were outliers for that population on that distribution. But when we're talking about outliers for a correlation, it's not that this value is particularly strange for this x variable or even for just the y variable. It's that it doesn't correspond with the what you would, ex what you would expect them to vary similarly. So we can test for that in jump. So back in jump, you guessed it, you can go back to the magic red triangle down here towards the bottom is this outlier analysis. And the Malanobis distance is another nice tool to be able to visualize whether or not you have outliers. And what this one does is it basically gives you a threshold based on your sample size and power and using a threshold of 0.05. And any observations that fall beyond that threshold could be considered to be significant outliers. We have one here that's right on the margin, um, but really not an obvious outlier. The other thing to keep in mind is even if you do have significant outliers, meaning they just don't fit the relationship, it doesn't mean that they can be removed from the data set, right? It just means we should look and see if there's anything that might be wrong with that observation. It just is a way to flag observations that don't fit with everything else that we're seeing. So that was a really quick run through of just a simple correlation between two variables. But typically in our field, we collect a lot more data than just two variables on each observation. Usually if we're out there, we measure lots of different things. And one example um, would be foliar chemistry data that was collected from hemlock across the region. So in this data set, we were trying to identify if foliar chemistry could be uh, linked to resistance of hemlock to hemlock woolly adelgid. So we want to know basically does foliar chemistry impart any tolerance to HWA infestation. When we talk about foliar chemistry there are a suite of different uh, elements that we might be interested in, elements and compounds. Um, and we're really looking to see, we're really truly interested in whether or not they're impacting this health rating um, or the percent infestation. In other words, if you have a particular uh, nutrient set up, does that mean that hemlock woolly adelgid does better and has more babies, so the percent infestation goes up? Um, or does it just, does this chemistry directly impact the health of the tree itself? So lots of variables that I want to enter. So when we enter all of these different variables into jump, so we're interested in all of these different chemical variables and we were interested in both the percent infestation and the overall health rating so I'll add those two. It doesn't look like anything happened but they were tacked on to the very bottom there. So when I click OK, holy mackerel, I just entered a lot of variables and I get a lot of output. Again, jump is visual so it's going to try to give us a scatter plot for every one of these possible combinations. It gives us this Pearson's correlations. Again, this is a mirror image across this diagonal so I can just choose to interpret one half of this diagonal, either the lower left or the upper right. Um, and I can see each of my Pearson's correlations here. Jump also tries to make it easier for us by putting the indirect or the negative relationships in red and the direct or the positive relationships in blue. And the stronger the color, the stronger the relationship. In fact, I bet that I have 
uh, non-normal data in this data set. So I'm just going to skip right to my non-parametric Spearman's row correlations. And here they are all tacked on. And holy mackerel, are there a lot of them. And not only are there a lot, there are a lot that are significant. And that's because there's quite a bit of autocorrelation among each of these. So even though I'm interested in percent infestation and health and how that's correlated with, with all of these different uh, compounds, the reality is I don't know which of these are truly related and which of these are just spurious correlations. So for example, is aluminum really significant? It sure looks significant. Or is it just that aluminum happens to be correlated with calcium and it's calcium that's truly related. In other words, it's the mechanism for that relationship. The calcium is actually imparting that tolerance. So we can actually test for that. And the way that we do that is with partial correlations. But you can't run your partial correlations on everything. You can only run partial correlations on the significant variables. So I would go in and I would say, OK, which of my variables that I'm truly interested in are significant? I can see that magnesium is not and lignin is not. So I would go back and I would pull those two out. Right? So lignin and magnesium not significant. I enter those. Bring back the two that I'm truly interested in. Verify that I have what I'm looking for by bringing back my Spearman's row. Okay, scroll down to what I'm interested in. Here is my percent infestation and yes, now I am limited to all significant variables. So there is a lot of autocorrelation in here. I want to find out really the unique contribution of each of these variables to the variability in percent infestation. So from the magic red triangle, I can come in and I can ask for the partial correlations. And this is tacked on up above. So if I scroll back up, here's now the matrix for my partial correlations. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that partial correlations are quantifying the unique contribution of each of your variables to the other. Okay, So the values you see here are always going to be lower than the original correlations that you had calculated with either the Pearsons or the Spearmans. Okay, So it's really just looking at the relative magnitude of each of these. So for example, I was interested in percent infestation. And again, this is a mirror image along the diagonal, so I'm only going to look at the lower left. If I wanted to see which of all of my uh, foliar nutrients were most closely related to percent infestation, I would look at these partial correlations. I see 0 0.07, 0 0.07, 0 0.03, 0 0.02, 0 0.06, 0.09. Wow, OK, it really comes down to nitrogen. This is by far the largest, the highest partial correlation. And it's positive, so I can still interpret the direction. But what this is telling me is that even though all of these other variables are significantly correlated with percent infestation, it's really only because they are correlated with nitrogen. And nitrogen is the only one that has a unique relationship with percent infestation. And this actually makes sense ecologically because we know that you are what you eat. And just like plants, hemlock woolly adelgid needs nitrogen to be healthy and reproductive. Uh, and so the more nitrogen this foliage has, the healthier the hemlock woolly adelgid population is. So I might interpret this by saying there are significant correlations between all of these different foliar nutrients and the percent infestation. And I could list my shorthand for those. But however, the partial correlations show us that really these other variables are only spuriously, spuriously associated with percent infestation. And that really, it's the percent nitrogen that is most closely correlated with percent infestation. Okay. So those partial correlations are going to help you interpret what really is a mess of our correlation, or just spurious correlations among each other, among the variables themselves that aren't really of interest to you.
the math behind those partial correlations is pretty complicated. We're certainly not going to get into it here, but essentially what this is doing is it's helping us to identify those spurious correlations that we talked about before when we were trying to identify or critique different statistical analyses. So the partial correlations are a very powerful tool for helping us to identify those spurious correlations and therefore isolate the true relationships that we're looking for. Okay, I just want to end with a few final words of caution. These Pearsons and Spearmans and partial correlations are all looking for linear relationships. They are not going to help us identify nonlinear relationships, which are equally of interest. And that's why Jump is always graphing out our data for us, so that if we see something like this, we know the correlation that we're going to calculate is going to be very low. But it's because we shouldn't be using a correlation. We should be using a nonlinear analysis. The other thing to keep in mind is that if you're running correlations on rates, averages, or any other kind of smooth data, it can be um, a little bit misleading because they will usually be a stronger correlation than if you had run it on individual, like act, the actual unit of observation. And I can't sign off without reminding everybody that we're just talking about relationships. We can't make any statements about causality from these relationships. We can present hypotheses for why relationships may exist, but to really get into those uh, causal agents, we'd have to do a lot more testing. So just be very careful in how you are wording your conclusions and your interpretation of the data. So until next time, Happy correlating.